The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello there. Obi-Wan Kenobi here, also known as James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan. Jedi Master Pro Koon. And many other characters in the world of Star Wars. You're listening to... Shh, don't tell. It's the secrets of Star Wars. May the Force be with you. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away. From movies and books, TV shows, and more, we are looking at the deeper themes and meanings found in the Star Wars universe. And this week, we are discussing the finale episode of Star Wars The Acolyte, conveniently titled The Acolyte. (laughs) Be be sure to follow The Secrets of Star Wars. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your favorite podcast app, or on the StarQuest YouTube channel. And you can find us over on Facebook at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, on X, where we are at SQPN, or on Instagram, where you can find us at StarQuest Network. And be sure to get your official Secrets of Star Wars gear over at sqpn.com slash merch. I'm your host, Thomas Salerno, and joining me tonight on the panel are Robert King. Hello, Robert. Hi, Thomas. It's good to be here. Hey, and Pat Mason. Hey there, Pat. Howdy, Thomas. All right, so, man, there is a lot of confusing, interesting, <laughs> and in in my case, infuriating things to talk about in this episode. But first, I just want to give a brief recap of the finale. Full spoilers are on everybody. Um, but yeah, let's dive in. So Sol and May arrive in orbit over Brendock. May escapes in a shuttle, leaving Soul, uh, leading Soul on a chase through the planet's rings before the uh, before both ships suffer a hard re-entry. Osha sees a vision of May, and she and Chimere depart together while a mysterious figure it, it's Darth Plagueis, guys. There's no <laughs> there's no mystery about it. But while a mysterious figure looks on in the ruins of the Coven's fortress, Soul and Chimere duel. While Osha confronts May, Sol reveals that he knew Osha and May were the same person in two bodies, mysteriously created by the Virgins on Brendock. He also confesses to killing Mother Anasea. In anger, Osha murders Sol and corrupts the kyber crystal of Sol's saber. Osha agrees to become Chimere's acolyte, and May consents to having her memory wiped with the Force. Jedi Master Vernestra arrives on Brendock and senses the presence of Chimere, her former apprentice. In the aftermath of the Brendock incident, Vernestra discovers Sol's body and arranges for a cover-up, lying to the Senate by pinning, pinning the string of murders on Sol. Vernestra recruits May to help her track down Chimere before leaving to consult with Jedi Master Yoda. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i have a lot of thoughts on this but first i i want to get your guys reactions both to this finale and also to the series as a whole if you like so um uh pat let's let's start with you what are your thoughts i was happy that we finally found out what happened in full force mm-hmm. <laughs> and and how everybody felt about it I was disappointed in most of the resolutions and I was, uh, I think he used the word infuriating. (laughs) I was infuriated by most of the Minestra stuff. And uh, honestly, very confused uh, by the May Osha stranger chimera stuff that all didn't make just a lick of sense to me for the most part. Um, 
So yeah, that that's that's kind of where I am sort of with the show as a whole and with uh that episode. All right, Robert, what about you? I not not dissimilar. I I was loving the episode up until the sisters were had escaped and were meeting under the the Bantu tree and I'm like, "Oh, they've been, you know, the Bantu tree is this uh, um, you know, this this vivid symbol throughout the show and the sisters who who were two and now are to finally together, something cool is going to happen here and they split the sisters up again and and it it yeah. just felt like they actually had a really good ending for this series and they threw it away in favor of, you know, trying to open it up for season two. It, mm-hmm. it felt like they're begging for a second season and they threw away what could have been a really satisfying ending to this season. Um, yeah. So, so I, I also found the ending uh, dissatisfying. I don't know if I would say infuriating, <laughs> but I, I would definitely say dissatisfying. Um, Patrick, were, uh, you you were particularly dissatisfied with Vernestra, um, and I, I hear this a lot from people who have read a lot of the High Republic books. Are are you among those who are High Republic readers? No. I haven't read a single stitch. Oh, okay. I'm just ticked <laughs> off, like because uh, her actions are effectively a um, a general anti Jedi propaganda message, uh, and I'm just like, I'm. It's not what I wanted. I mean, it's it just. <sighs> by by anti Jedi, you mean like corrupt Jedi? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, Jedi, yeah. the whole Jedi order is corrupt. Like, like I love the fact that when it came down to it, this was. Four people on a mission. Everybody made choices. Most of them were bad. Things right. went, and plus things went sideways. Mm-hmm. And and the fallout from that. Beautiful, wonderful storyline. Was great. It, the whole, like, oh, and then also the Jedi, the whole Jedi is corrupt as well. I was like, well, you didn't even need that. <laughs> like, it wasn't necessary for the story that you have her trying to hide things and being manipulative and at the same time being Spock like I, I just I don't know. It was it it was just infuriating, her in general. Um yeah. I think I, I, I kinda have to agree with you there, Pat, that those those were pretty much my feelings. Um in terms of the Jedi who were on the Brendock mission and the fact that it, you know, went completely sideways. Everyone made these very poor decisions, you know, was not thinking clearly. I actually found that that created a lot of interesting storytelling and and very effective drama i had i had no problem with that at all and i and i understand that you know um we can we we have had stories in the past where we've seen corrupt jedi or corruption at the highest levels of the jedi order so i I understand what this show was trying to do in this case it did not work with me i because i i i feel that this show is a is essentially represents the Sith critique of the Jedi, mm-hmm. and I felt that we did not effectively get the Jedi answer to that critique. That that was my feeling. That I, I'm like, so you're you're just showing the Sith argument without showing us the Jedi counter argument because. It it and it, it it almost may lead one to believe that you know by the time of the Clone Wars you know it's kind of like well maybe the Jedi deserved what they got you know I I I certainly don't think that but it might you know like the 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 Order seems at this point at at very high levels so thoroughly compromised that and again it's I get that that's realistic but. You know, for for whatever reason, that just that did not work with me at all. In in the ways in the ways that Clone War stories have worked with me, and I'm I'm still kind of processing my feelings as to why this show on that kind of fundamental level didn't connect 
with me because I've I've seen the Jedi mess up before. I've seen them I've seen them let two Jedi masters on the High Council disappear and them do nothing. And I, mm-hmm. I'm referring to, of course, both Sifo DS and Yaddle. Mm-hmm. And so I've I've seen them be either massively corrupt or massively incompetent. And I've been okay with that. But yeah. I wish I could articulate it better, other than that. Something about this show, that story, that part of the storyline did not work with me. And I'm not, that's, instead it just left me cold, you know? That's fascinating to me. We, this, this was, I, I remember when I saw the prequel trilogy for the first time and that sort of shock of the uh, incompetence and or corruption of the Jedi was part of my initial dislike of the prequel trilogy. Mm. Um, I've since come to to recognize more what Lucas was doing with that trilogy. And um, though I think he had some like technical issues with his storytelling, I think it's, it's, it's an amazing story he was telling. Yeah. But I think that's why I dislike the Clone Wars uh, cart- animated series. Because it feels like it's, it feels like it's uh, coming out of the Jedi propaganda engine, hmm. and it's denying the incompetence slash corruption that we know is there. Um, it, it it feels like that it, and and I know that's not absolutely true of every episode or every scene right. in it, but um, but it it, it felt like. Um, that series was trying to glorify the Jedi in um, in a number of ways. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's almost interesting. I not to get sucked too much into Clone Wars, but I almost thought that the series for me provided extra context, whereby you know, and I can't claim to have seen every episode of Clone Wars, but I've seen enough of it to where I was like, the Jedi mess up in this period to such an extent that they allow them the, the the purpose of the Jedi to be defenders of the defenseless to be perverted into becoming the enforcement arm of the mm-hmm. Republic participating in a war that is fundamentally unjust because it's contrived right you know and I almost felt that like Clone Wars showed me more of like of the slow motion train wreck of how that <laughs> takes place and how the Jedi get more and more compromised as the war continues. Um, and I, and again, I understand that this series is trying to set up the seeds of that far earlier, you know, with both the rise of the Sith and the Jedi's uh, arrogance, mm-hmm. really in, in believing that they have this kind of, and it, it, it really does confirm to me that the Jedi should never have been so in in cahoots with the Republic government. They should not have been essentially an arm of the Republic or an enforcement arm of the Republic because it just gets them into doing st- doing stuff for political reasons, you know. Yeah. And I, I think like what we get between episodes two and three and all the material that occurs between the Clone Wars and mm-hmm. is the chess match between the Jedi Council and Palpatine. Um, right. well, well, we get the whole story, right? We mm-hmm. get both sides of it. We kind of see both sides of it play out um, through the movies and the TV show. We, we get to see the, the Jedi basically being outmaneuvered, not matched. Um, the problem with, with this show, with Vanestra stuff, like there's no like the only why I have to grasp onto is just she's doesn't want to make the order look bad. But like all the stuff about pinning it completely on soul didn't make any sense to me um, outside of possibly who was she trying to call and why was she trying to call them? And now I have to go, OK, the only way Vernestra is going to make sense is I have to have a season two. And that kind of cheeses me off, to be honest, <laughs> going into this as a mini series right. that I thought was going to be self-contained. And now I have, you know, and she's not the only one, obviously, but she is a loose end now that has to be tied up later. 
with more show. Um, yeah. And Robert, yeah. you and I were kind of talking about this before we started recording how this 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 ending could not have didn't need to be this uneven and messy if it had just no. been a complete story. <clears throat> no, I think I think it could have left the possibility of a season two open. Mm hmm. Um, it, you know, both sisters go off with Chimere. Um, they, they could have even hinted at Vernestra, like looking for, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to protect the, the independence or the power of the Jedi order with the Senate? Um, you know, they could have, they could have hinted at that or, or even put it out you know, put it out there explicitly, but, um, yeah, I, I, it, it just seems like they unnecessarily muddied the, the storyline and, um, especially with the splitting of the, of the two sisters. Um, yeah, that made no sense. Like just like none. The splitting and, of the sisters. Right. Yeah. I, I absolutely hate it when TV shows decide to do that. It's like, okay, <laughs> We're going to have these like two or three characters make a super quick, but gigantically momentous decision, like in, in the span of less than three minutes, and, <laughs> and do these like irreversible things, like completely wipe someone's memory away and, and switch people and send one to go, you know, be a dark side Sith acolyte. And the other's going to jump in with the Jedi with a mind wipe. Like none of that makes any sense. Like who even came up with that idea? <laughs> Especially with, with, you know, OSHA saying, you know, I'll find you. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but I thought She's you were right there. Just take up. her with, yeah. Like, yeah. Or, or ditch Chimera, and because you're obviously more powerful than him, and just <laughs> take yeah. his ship. Like, it doesn't, like, what they decided to do doesn't make any sense. I mean, yeah. and I, I get it. We have Chimera's... a whole episode. What's that? I'm sorry, Pat. Uh, I mean, we get that whole episode where Chimera is sort of worming his way into Osha's mind and all that, but it didn't mm -hmm. feel like it worked. <laughs> like that was sort of the fallout. Especially because I felt he was very uneven in this finale. Especially because at at the beginning, when when he finds Osha with the helmet on and she's you know obviously in in distress, like he instead of the manipulator, he he sort of breaks. He he almost seems like he's genuinely distressed that she's having an episode well and, and, and he's like, having what? some kind of an episode too his eyes go black and, yeah which they don't and, explain yeah and he's having some kind of um you know otherworldly experience there himself similar mm -hmm. to what they've shown earlier in the series um similar to what the the witches were doing uh to the jedi what mother anisea was doing getting inside the minds of the Jedi. Right. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's a really interesting kind of seed to drop. And, and, you know, that, that's something that you can explore in a season two, but it's not like leaving the series unsatisfyingly ended mm -hmm. to include it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, whereas I think splitting the sisters, is is at least to my narrative sense it's dissatisfying um, yeah yeah i i i tend to agree with that um in in terms of other characters um we we have soul what did you guys think of that seemingly to the bitter end he he seems to have difficulty admitting he was wrong mm. you know like He's still saying we were justified in intervening, you know. We did what we thought was right, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. and it's like, well, I, I get that you did what you thought was right, but it was clearly not right. Like, that doesn't, that's just simply the ends justifying the means, you know. And there's this sort of, I notice in the show, this sort of tension between, like, I think his genuine and unfeigned care for Osha with his kind of self-righteousness, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, I, I, I don't know how I feel about how this series left us with him. 
I still really enjoyed him as a character. I thought mm -hmm. his very final moments, um, as she was choking him out and, and he said, Osha, it's okay. I'm not sure exactly what he was meaning to do with that, but I think, I think he did finally come to recognize that he had done something wrong and, and that, you know, there was some kind of justice in his, in his punishment for it. Um, not that I would fully agree with that. I mean, I, <laughs> You know, so getting randomly choked out by your 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 uh former apprentice is uh, i you know without any kind of due process or or <laughs> you know yeah. um whereas may initially wants him put on trial yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, and, we're, and and wikipedia initially described soul's death as a mercy killing slash euthanasia oh really and, yes luckily that was edited away but i'm like no wikipedia it was straight up murder yeah you know like there's nothing mercy killing about it like it's i don't know who came up with that but that 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 angered me when i first read it i'm like no she murders him yeah you know yeah. in a fit of rage you know yeah vengeful rage mm -hmm. yeah. um so i i think you know what's interesting most interesting to me about that scene is he never says i'm sorry Yes. There's no, yeah. there's no apology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the same time, if we look at the series as a whole, there's also no forgiveness. There is no desire to apologize or to to seek forgiveness, and there is no forgiveness given right. um, throughout the whole series with all of these characters. Right. And the only so, thing that's that's called you know the absolution is uh, is Torben's suicide. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and we oh, yeah. and we know that's not. Valid. That's not true. <laughs> no, like, yeah, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> that's not. That's neither. That it's forgiveness, nor is it really truly seeking forgiveness. It's not uh, a valid form of the, the sacrament. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't. You know, it doesn't end thing anyways. You gotta. You're still going on on the other side of it, anyways. Um, but we see it with uh, Kanaka, right? Mm. He used his claws. I have to banish myself to the wastelands for forever and, and never get to see anybody. That's not forgiveness. That's not seeking. I mean, it's a, it's a form of like self punishment, mm -hmm. right. Or self flagellation. Um, it's potentially a penitential act depending on how it's undertaken, mm -hmm. but it's not, there's no forgiveness sought forgiveness given. Right. And plus, I mean, culpability, right. You're, you're under the control of a bunch of witches, but either way, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, and we see Saul, he doesn't seek forgiveness either. He doesn't say, I'm sorry. He doesn't apologize. Um, obviously we have the example of the stranger, right? Who there is, I don't take any actions that require forgiveness, right? I don't follow any rules, right? There are mm -hmm. no rules, so I don't break any rules. So I don't have to forget, ask forgiveness for anything. So I can just murder people. I, I want to. That's um, the Joker's so logic. Yes, Dark Knight. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so I I thought this was from the more I I thought about it, the lack of there being any sort of drive for forget because you know it there is sort of an internal critique of the Jedi posing themselves as a religion, and they explicitly um, you know, say that. In this episode, one of yeah. the the yeah. primary key things about Christianity is the the forgiveness piece of it. Like you don't you don't find that in as stressed or as foundational a concept in most religions, but it is in Christianity. And so it's off putting when we see a religion play out or a philosophical theological system play out that doesn't have that piece. It doesn't really seem to to emphasize it. Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I was like, yeah, nobody really seems to like they all seem to are tortured internally by the bad things that they've done, but they don't seem to understand the path out of that is through uh, seeking forgiveness and being forgiven. It's very much like what Chimere says to Soul. I've accepted my darkness. What have you done with yours? Because Soul does not have a way to process his own darkness. 
Yeah. You know, he doesn't have a way to process it or work through it or, you know, other than try and justify it. So that, yeah. Again, like, I, I, I understand on a, on a narrative level, on a philosophical level, what this show was trying to do. It also may have been like, I didn't need this show at this season of my life. I, th- I think that's <laughs> also perhaps a valid um, uh, way to look at it. It's just that I'm like, I didn't need this show right now. <laughs> but, um, you know, who knows? Maybe if I, you know, I don't know, a few years from now, if I come back to this show, maybe I'll see it completely differently. I, I want to touch on on that thing that sent Senator, what's his name? What is it? R- Rayan Court? Was that his uh, name? Yeah, I think so. Okay. He calls the Jedi a massive system of unchecked power posing as a religion, a delusional cult that claims to control the uncontrollable. And when Vanestra objects that the Jedi don't control the Force, the Senator says, no, not the Force, your emotions. So I thought that was interesting that the... He claims the Jedi try to control emotions, which he posits as inherently uncontrollable. I, I mean, there's, there's a lot to, to <laughs> critique in that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the core of of what he's going for in in his critique is mm-hmm. correct. That the the way that the Jedi try to harness, um. Uh, you know, they, they try to use the force, um, Mm -hmm. and in doing so, they deny something that is essential to their humanity. And I think that is an actual error in the Jedi philosophy and approach. Um, I don't think it's entirely emotions and I don't think emotions are entirely uncontrollable. Um, I mean, one, one of the, I'm, I'm a big fan of virtue ethics and, um, one of the, the premises of virtue ethics is that the more you practice virtue, the more everything in your life kind of falls into line with what you're practicing. Um, and it's not that your emotions go away, it's that your emotions, um, have have pathways to go through in order to express themselves appropriately um and if you don't give them pathways to go through then they make pathways of their own and they get messy and and um and cause all kinds of problems um and and i think the the jedi as they've been presented um since the prequels um have that problem of of denying appropriate pathways for the expression of of emotion and um and 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 i think a sense of of uh it's not just emotional attachment it's you know genuine human attachment they they kind of treat um the human person as um, human being broadly, I'm not being speciesist here. Um, <laughs> um, being you, yeah, the 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 intelligent person, the you know the the um, person who has an intellectual soul, um, <laughs> whatever whatever planet you come from, um, treating you as as if you are not meant for communion with others, as if you are not meant to be part of a community that your individuality is best expressed in the context of a community. And I think that's something that the, the Jedi miss. Um, so, right. I don't know. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> well, I, and I think, you know, his, his critique is basically a summation of what the show has been trying to scream at us for, for pretty much the whole time. And we kind of get from Chimera as we go through it. Well, whatever. It's just a very quick summation of that. Right. It's like, if you but, haven't been paying attention, here it is. Here it know, is. Like, yeah, exactly. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, at the same time, it is also flawed, right? It has its true piece. And I think it also has the flaw, which is that the, the Jedi are, 
power hungry, right? And that is that is the line Palpatine uses. That is the line anybody would use if they viewed the Jedi as some edifice to take down as a political career maker, or maybe very likely, I would guess that the Senator probably had a bad run in with a a Jedi. Um, Maybe because the Jedi found himself, him doing something wrong, maybe because he ran into a bad Jedi, either one, possibly both. Um, And so he views them as just this overwhelmingly powerful organization that he needs to check and take down or whatever. But that's not really the Jedi, right? They're not right. It takes, it takes, literally a war being thrust upon them and Palpatine kind of handing over the reins of the army to them more or less with a free hand and them taking it because it's for the good of the Republic for them to get embroiled in the whole power thing. But other than that, they're not really about power. They're, you know, about trying to follow the will of the force. And so that is where his critique, uh, critique just, utterly fall short, at least in my eyes. It's, it's a lot like, um, I think of, of, uh, when I was in college, you know, studying Western history, we studied Marxism and I remember thinking Marxism has a really great critique of unbridled capitalism. Right. But its solution is worse than the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The medicine, um, medicine and, that kills you. <laughs> and and mm-hmm. that's that's kind of the sense I'm getting from this this show is the Sith have a really great critique of the problems of the Jedi. But the their solution is worse than the problem. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um yeah. and and likewise, um I, I don't know it, it, what solution the senator is proposing. You know, an external review seems, you know, at least on the surface, fairly reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, we will see if there's a season two, I suppose. But um, yeah, it's. I think I think this is one of the reasons that the show uh, resonated with me. Maybe for exactly the same reasons it doesn't resonate with you, Thomas. Hmm. Um, because for me. I have wanted to see a recognition of just the difficulty of having an ideal uh, embodied in an institution that over and over fails and it falls to corruption and, and falls short. And um, I mean, I'm particularly thinking about my experience with, the Catholic church, um, over the, you know, frankly, my entire life, but especially, um, since the allegations came out in, in 2001 and, and so on. Um, and, you know, just having this vision of what Christ wants the church to be and how far, far short of that we fall, Mm -hmm. particularly those in leadership. Mm. Um, and I mean, there are lots of other institutions that we can point to as well. I mean, some people will point to the police. Some people will point to uh, like big corporations like Amazon or, or you know, or, or you know, mega billionaires or, or you know, or, yeah, you, you, the Congress, you know, or the, the FBI, Congress. you know, it's yeah, like yeah. no institutions are looking great these days. Exactly. You know? And and it just, you know, for me, I appreciated sort of turning the lens that direction on the Jedi. Um, Mm -hmm. And And I, 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 uh, no, I was just gonna say, I appreciate that. Definitely. I think what I am really seeking though, is that we, I, I feel like we, I've, I've consumed a lot of that recently in terms of seeing the failures of the Jedi and the, the period of their kind of, few centuries of decline, you know, bringing us towards the rise of the empire and the near extermination of the order. And I'm just waiting for them to finally show us the guardians of peace and justice that reigned for a thousand generations. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, I I just keep waiting for that and waiting for that. And they're not giving it to me. <laughs> and I'm like and I'm like okay, I I I I get it. The Jedi had this kind of slow, you know, uh, decline into into decrepitude like, you know, and then a very swift 
you know, fall, you know, and, and once you read more about the, um, the, the Templar order that they're based on, it's, there's a lot of parallels there where they became very powerful in some cases corrupt, but then had like a slow decline and then just, you know, overnight Mm -hmm. end up being wiped out. So it's like, it's, there's interesting historical parallels there, you know, but I, but I want to see the Jedi be those, like, like how did they become like you, you don't become this legendary order over centuries. If you're not, you know, at least in some ages living up much better to the ideal that you have set for yourselves. And I guess I kind of want to see that, you know, and and there's, there's hints of projects that maybe will show us that, you know, about either the origins of the Jedi or the very old Republic. But I, I don't know, you know, I, I totally respect what this show is trying to do. It's just not, what I needed right now, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's fair. like I have so little faith in a lot of institutions in real life. It's like I want to <laughs> believe in the Jedi. Yeah. I want to believe in them. I'm like, so <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and that's, I think that's my problem with the Vernestra stuff is it just mm. either she is an example of the corrupt Jedi. Or there's something else going on there that is only going to be exposed by a potential season two, which is a maybe mm-hmm. or not. And I, I'm not interested in uh, the a whole Jedi Order is corrupt. And I, I, you know what I really want is a show that does stuff with Jedi like we got to see Obi-Wan do in uh, episode two, Attack the Clones, where he just... He, he finds a thread and he runs it down and does a bunch of investigating. I want to see that. Hmm. Give me a show where the Jedi do that <laughs> and act in a virtuous manner as they go. Um, you know, this, this was a good, I, and the, the funny part is I really think this was a good show outside of like the last 15 minutes. This mm-hmm. to me, this was a really, really good show. It's I, strong I, points absolutely. are very strong. I will I say love that. The fact, yeah. Like the, the even, you know, in the microcosm of the four Jedi who were involved in the incident, they're all, you know, they all have their problems, but they all were acting in a way that they thought was the best for the situation. They weren't, you know, terrible people doing terrible things or trying to cover something up or and it for me it just it felt like one of those movies or one of those shows that that sort of okay, terrible thing happened and we're going to piece it back together and and we'll have resolution at the end. The problem is I didn't get any of that resolution at the end. <laughs> even even yes. in little things, like, why did Basil sabotage the ship? Yeah. Like, <laughs> didn't make why? Any sense. Like, I just, oh, there were so many oh things. <laughs> Basil, Do you have a theory, Robert? <laughs> Basil, like, Basil struck me as like the, the, the anti Finn of this show, you know, like in the, in the sequel trilogy, Finn was this like really interesting integral character who just kept getting sidelined and and mm-hmm. sent off to do like nonsensical or or inconsequential stuff and and it's like no no Finn's a great character bring him in and yeah. give him something cool to do that's that's central to the the story and Basil was this kind of side character like a throwaway character who kept being like pulled out from the sidelines and put in the middle <laughs> of things <laughs> It's like, what are you doing here? You don't really belong here. (laughs) You're not a central character. Why are you central to the plot suddenly? And it was very contrived because they were, he didn't need to sabotage. Okay, from a writing point of view, they didn't need to have Basil sabotage his ship. They're flying, both of them are flying through the, 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 the planetary rings of that planet a piece of debris could have easily hit soul ship in the wrong place and accomplished the same thing sure without confusing us all (laughs) i I will say that is probably one of the brightest points in that episode was that uh flight through into and through the rings that was gorgeous that was beautiful visual effects are amazing yeah so it reminds me a lot of the the episode the eye in andor with the the visual effects from that episode where they're yes, flying that, yes. that phenomenon mm, or which I was is also of one of my highlights <laughs> the uh the the bone rings around the the night sister planet in ahsoka mm. Mm, the, the mm-hmm. very cool kind of 
space geography, what whatever the real word for that is. But <laughs> I like, yeah, I, I like that. That was it. Was almost like they were flying through diamonds. It was yeah. it was beautiful. Yeah, with those those sort of pillars of 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 asteroids linking the two levels of the rings. Yeah, mm-hmm. oh, it was it was awesome all over the place. Yeah, great sequence. Um, but yeah, like why? He just opens up a panel and starts pulling wires out. I'm like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. While we're talking visuals, mm-hmm. I also loved the fight between Soul and Chimere, and oh, especially God. very good, so especially amazing. the moment where um, Soul is pushed off the bridge, and then you know, in in just gorgeous waifu. Um, that I haven't seen since uh, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It was just like beautiful, yes. like floating down to the ground, and 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 ah, oh, I just love that stuff. Um, yeah, no, and- that was very cool. I wanted them to have a really cool Jedi versus Sith lightsaber one on one lightsaber mm-hmm. fight in this show, and that that kind of delivered that for me. I'm like, yes, more of that, please. Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> And Watch I love that thing Keimer's saber does, where it 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 divides into two, but the the second saber is like this little knife, this little lightsaber knife. That yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What what do they call that? The 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 shorter sword in the in the long sword short sword combination. Oh, like Ahsoka's of, buckler. Um, a lot of times, it's, um, it, in the in the Japanese martial arts tradition, it has a name, and I'm oh, forgetting it has what a it different is. name. Mm. Yeah, let me see if I can look it up quickly. Anyway, keep talking. <laughs> well, so, and it's interesting because um, both Soul and Chimera change lightsaber fighting styles over the course of that battle, right? When Chimera yeah. has his single saber and he's going, I want to say it's like form six or seven. It's just that, or I want to say that's right, where you're just like constantly throwing yourself at the enemy. It's the same style that Palpatine uses. Um, mm-hmm. And then... Once he pulls the double out, then he's back to form two because that's how you how you. But it's because there's a short sword; it's slightly different, so it's not the same as we see Anakin use uh, it in uh, at the end of Episode Two against Dooku. And but Soul just like counters it; he is like yeah. immediately switch forms to counter that, and so it speaks a lot to Soul's, um, I guess, focus on martial <laughs> capabilities. I, yeah, and, I, I noted the moment when Soul switched forms, and I was like, ooh, that's cool, you know? Yeah. And I don't know if you caught the, the triple kick he did on uh, Chimer's chest. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's a callback. So if you remember from the first Matrix movie, <laughs> when <laughs> Keanu Reeves does that oh. jump up and he does a kick, he was originally supposed to do a double kick or a triple kick while he was up there, but Keanu couldn't actually pull it off. And so he ends up just doing a single, you know, single half. But like then, then we get the full. I don't know. I don't know. For me, it was a very much a callback because Carrie Ann Moss, Moss is mm-hmm. in the show. So <laughs> I was like, aha, somebody who can do the move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And another, an, another thing, just going back to threads that were in little things that were not pulled together is, is the Bunta tree. What, oh, yeah. what is the significance of that? Is it, my theory was that the Bunta tree is the virgins somehow. It, it's this weird glowing tree and they keep coming back to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's different from all the other vegetation on the planet. And I'm like, okay, yeah. that. But no, they don't do anything with that. So, yeah. I, I yeah. would have been perfectly fine if May and Osha had merged with the tree, become one of it, and then Chimera had escaped, and the Jedi were on his trail, and and then we go back to Vernestra, and she's like, "Oh, I almost had him." And then season two is just her still trying to take, like, like it turns out the whole thing was her and Chimera trying to to get at each other. <laughs> like huh. that would have been yeah. perfect, <laughs> but no, that would have been a great ending. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I like that. but yeah um just and and then darth plagueis cameo for reasons i mean i i was expecting it before the series was out um and it, it 
one little, I guess, lore bit that it kind of proves is that like Darth Sidious, like Palpatine himself, um, it seems, at least to me, that Plagueis had multiple apprentices over the course of his time as the Dark Lord of the Sith. Unless he was just spot, happened to be on that planet and was just spying on Chimere. And Chimere's not really his apprentice. So. That again, unanswered sense. questions. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think the plague is. Okay, this is Robert, you know, predicting something. So it must be wrong because I <laughs> have correct predictions. But it, it looks to me like they're using Plagueis as a way to connect the events of this show to the Skywalker saga. Yes. That, that this is, you know, that Plagueis begins to use, you know, is also looking for the virgins to, Mm -hmm. you know, pursue his immortality Voldemort scheme. And, and, um, that, that then connects to Palpatine who discovers how to use the virgins to create life following on, um, you know, the, what the sisters did and the witch sisters and, um, you know, and, and then suddenly it's all part of the same plot arc again. And, right. Mm-hmm. And, and that too is a little bit disappointing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that you brought up Voldemort cause he looks very much like Voldemort in this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's supposed to look like that. He's, he's a moon. He's the same species as the banking clan. And uh, Voldemort. Which is, and and Voldemort apparently, <laughs> yeah. Vol- Voldemort was a member of the banking clan all along. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> this all tracks, yes. It all, all tracks. It's clearly yeah. canon, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, I, I liked again that they've they've brought a character over from Legends, a, a major character, and sort of kept him basically the way he's supposed to look, like they did with Thrawn. You know, they're, um, mm, mm-hmm. and yeah, there was always sort of this idea that the Plagueis novel was still kind of soft canon because it hadn't been contradicted yet. You know, I, I think you even said this to me once, Robert, unless I'm thinking, unless someone else told that, said that to me and I'm completely misremembering. It was either me or somebody else. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only two choices. Well, it had to be someone. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I sort of go by that same logic that, like, something in Legends, you know, is sort of soft canon until they completely contradict it, and then it becomes part of the alternate timeline. But I mean, I, I have increasingly been treating Star Wars like the Arthurian mythos that mm. that this is there. There is not a completely consistent canon for anything there are just stories that are set in the star wars milieu um that use a lot of the same characters and sometimes contradict each other and have wildly different tones Mm -hmm. and uh you know i I just like the canon questions have i i think that's a that way lies madness (laughs) (laughs) i actually really like that analogy to the to the arthurian mythos and and there being this, it, everything being very fluid in the sense that, like, you know, like, yeah, all these use a lot of the same characters, but sometimes their fates are completely different. And, you know, you know, I almost feel like if Star Trek followed a similar logic, people wouldn't be so angry. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how I treat Star Trek media these days, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but if more, if more people. That's way to do it. <laughs> yeah. From if, what I've heard. If more people did that, you know, I feel like because in, in, in that universe, while they do have diverging timelines and stuff, everything in the main timeline has to be like solid canon, you know, which is, I feel like what Star Wars is trying to do. Everything in the canon timeline is, you know, irreversible until it's not until they decide someday that they're going to reverse it. But you're right. That way lies madness. I already feel stupider thinking about it. So, yeah. Yeah. And also you hear that secrets of star Trek. We've got your answers here for you. (laughs) (laughs) Far be it from me to try and tell star Trek fans how to, how to handle their own franchise. But, uh, (laughs) But um, yeah. but no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. J- j- just as someone who's like you know been on the edges of that 
fandom and dipped my toes in it. I almost wish it was more of that thing where it's like, oh, it's like I enjoy this bit of it. Mm-hmm. And not, and that and and but not this bit of it. And it kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier where, you know, it's like okay, maybe this bit of Star Wars media is not really for me, but there's plenty of other Star Wars media that is. And I feel like if if people just took that point of view, there wouldn't be... <laughs> Star Wars, it's all about points of view, right? There wouldn't be <laughs> so much, you know... And and, and I, I, I really feel like, like it, it's what you all... It's what everyone brings to each Star Wars series that kind of makes them that makes these discussions really great and interesting to talk about because we're all coming to each Star Wars project with our own expectations, our own tastes, our own backgrounds, our own personalities, all that stuff and all that goes in into what we into how we experience a particular Star Wars story. But instead of like this show where the three of us are are talking like <laughs> normal reasonable human beings about this stuff <laughs> a lot of the the it it just becomes tribalistic and i'm like it doesn't need to be that way guys okay i'm off my soapbox now but <laughs> yes your weapons you will not need them <laughs> <laughs> what's in there only what you take with you yes. you know it's like yes internet comments a realm of the dark side, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Once you start down that path, it will dominate your destiny. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I think it. We, I think we have reached that moment in the discussion where we start to go off the rails a little bit, and that's usually a signal to me. <laughs> that we we may be reaching the end point, but I just want to ask you guys: were, were were there any other major points that you wanted to touch on? Well, you you just mentioned that um, Star Wars is a lot about different points of view, and mm-hmm. uh, you know a certain point of view, and um, and I think this show was this is another thing that this show I think was explicitly trying to do mm. with um the titles of the episodes and, and they weren't able to be completely consistent with this but the titles of the episodes being you know slash titles with you know mm-hmm. kind of um opposite ideas opposite points of view for each episode um being presented and um and i thought yeah, again, that was one of the things that I really loved about the show was that it, it took that aspect of Star Wars that that I always found kind of problematic. It's like I'm not a big fan of of relativism, uh, moral or otherwise, and um, and it sort sort of shone a spotlight on the relativism that is a part of a lot of the Star Wars storytelling, and and mm. I thought that was great. What about you, Pat? You have any uh, other major points that we want to cover? Um. So okay, Vernestra, her ability to like walk into a space and like hear echoes from the past. Mm-hmm. I don't have we seen that Jedi power before? Is that because that was really cool yeah. <laughs> that, would, that would be super powerful and i i gotta admit i almost thought she was gonna be bring soul back i oh. i personally did not agree with the showrunners uh options to kill off soul um and that is you know funny enough the the way they went with hey we're going to set everything up for a season two even though we're not necessarily cleared for a season two is is with you know ocean may and Osha going on this journey with Chimera and them holding hands at the end over her. And a lightsaber was like the the place to do it, but just just weird and and <laughs> and that stuff. And I thought like a, a a perfect way to make a season two would have been to have kept Soul alive uh, because he is the primary. I think one of the primary characters most people related to and got mm-hmm. along with um, Osha and May's both who they are, like turns out who they are or is each other uh, at the same time, not terribly relatable. <laughs> like it's, and, 
And yeah. beyond that, they make a lot of choices. Both of them make a lot of choices throughout the series, which are very like question mark when you look at like, why did you make that choice at that time um, mm-hmm. to do things that way? Uh, beyond that, I did, I did like watching Osha kind of finally descend into her anger um, mm. and the way that they portrayed that both in her fight with uh, May, um, the kind of like May being the super even keeled person in that fight and Osha just being like all scream and vengeance <laughs> against against May and then eventually her turning the kyber crystal, bleeding the kyber crystal red. Yeah. Uh, that was a really cool visualization. Um and but I, I I'm not a fan of either Soul's death or the way she killed him, to be honest. And I get it. Like it's buying into Chimera's like final request for May to kill a Jedi without using a weapon. But still, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> like, like I think, I think honestly, I think Osha killing Soul in any way met that qualification because May set up the scene, right? She mm. she set up the scenario, which, like, it just it it hurts my mind seeing the decision she makes later on. Like, blank my mind, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to the Jedi, and so blank my mind, and I'm like, what is that all about? Like, you just found your sister, and and all that. Um, I think overall the show was mostly good until that like grasp for a season two. And it's unfortunately not the only show that's like blown its own leg off in an attempt to set up the next season. Um, I think they could have ended things differently, better and set up something. uh, uh, Honestly, a better season two, but, and, and, and the whole conversation with Vernestra in May at the end is just, it's everything with Vernestra. It's just like not creepy, but also super creepy at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. And yeah. I don't know if you guys noticed her office, but holy cow, did that thing scream Sith? Like, oh, oh. it was kind of like Palpatine's office. Almost. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. It had all like the 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 um, black and red uh, motif going everywhere, along with the sort of um, technology, but sort of the dark technology kind of stuff sort of how it's you know like clean shiny technology looks different than sort of the dark cluttered sith technology and that screams mm. more of the dark cluttered sith. i don't know it's just it scream fernestra's a bad guy um <laughs> like i don't know i don't know about or, you guys how yeah. you thought about that to quote anakin you're the sith lord <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly and to, i want to know to, to be fair <laughs> I was getting creepy dark side vibes from Vernestra from the very beginning of the show. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, which I, I really don't understand. I, because I understand that she's a fan favorite character from people who have read the high Republic novels. And I just feel like this needlessly would just anger a lot of fans to take the older version of this character in this direction. So, because mm-hmm. she seemed to be kind of like I encountered very little of her in the High Republic novels that and comics that I've read, but she seemed kind of like the Jedi's Jedi, you know, like. And in this, she's just unpleasant, and I'm like, what happened? So yeah. that's I feel like we're missing information, you know, like oh, she's like a, a hidden Sith Lord or just a dyed in the wool bureaucrat or she mm-hmm. actually cares. Like she does things where it seems like she really cares. And then she does other things where it's like, that's obviously evil. Yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah. Right. I guess From my other- point of view, the Jedi are evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I'm glad you made, I'm glad you brought that up, Robert, because one of the, I'll make a few more points. One, I feel like, one thing this series is trying to do is to show us where we could get to a place where a Jedi could say that about the Jedi. From my yes. point of view, the Jedi are evil. So I understand that's what they're, you know, backfilling, you know, as as a prequel to the prequels, you know. Um, also, the, the Force Echo sense thing, I've seen at least twice before. Once in the Force, uh, I was going to call it the Force Unleashed games, but that's not right. The the, in, in Jedi Fallen Order, I've seen it. Cal has the power to go around and sense previous events, and I'm pretty pretty sure Ahsoka uses it um, to sense the fight, um, to sense 
Sabine giving up the map to uh, um oh gosh what's his name uh Balin Balin Skull thank you yeah yeah he she she senses that encounter using that power so yeah it is an interesting power it does make you a little bit op though <laughs> but yeah i agree but um, it, it is a really cool power. It, but it's one of those powers that I feel like they can't use too often or it would kind of ruin it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, the, the last point I guess I'll make is that my feeling about the show is kind of like what it was at the beginning. And when we reviewed the first episode, I said that the the one thing I kind of came away with was that line that um, Yodi says, I believe in Attack of the Clones, where the dark side clouds everything. Mm, mm-hmm. yeah. And I really feel like, you know, that's, it's, that could almost be the light motif of this, this series. The dark side clouds everything. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. But anyway... Um, we definitely want to hear from you, our patrons. Um, what are your thoughts on the Acolyte, on the finale, the series overall? What are your, you know, if, if you please don't send us like a 10 page rant about it, but we do want to hear your, your, I mean, your comments. Again, if you or if you do, to. at least format it properly. Yeah. Yes, please <laughs> format it properly. <laughs> you can let us, and the no. best way to send us that would be at our email at starwarssqpn.com. <laughs> um, but for your other comments, you can reach out on our social media pages, or you can join the lively discussion on our StarQuest Discord server which you can find at sqpn.com slash discord. And we'd also like to take a moment to thank our patrons, including David V, Mardell B, Felix L, Claudia S, and James K. Their generous donations help us to create the secrets of Star Wars and all the shows here at StarQuest. And you can join them at sqpn.com slash give. So until next time, thank you, Robert King, for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Wars. Oh, thank you for having me. And Patrick Mason, thank you as well. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. And once again, I'm Thomas Salerno. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy. Let's Science. Find the show wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash science.